I can remember sage grouse, so damn thick mowing hay that you had to get off the tractor and shoo them out of the hay or you'd mow them up. The, the need to save, if you will, or conserve sage grouse um, is, is largely based on the fact that we're talking about an extraordinarily unique animal, an icon of the American West, if you will, that was first described by Lewis and Clark and in part defines our lifestyle as Westerners. This is not about a bird. This is about an ecosystem that sustains people and uh, sustains industry that is very important, not just to the state of Oregon, but this region. Uh, it certainly sustains a quality of life and um, tourism and recreation and things that also support rural economies. Uh, so that is what's at stake here. It's not just a bird. Sage grouse can serve as an umbrella species, if you will, uh, uh, and, and conserving sage grouse can have great benefits for animals including mule deer, pronghorn, pygmy rabbits, a variety of songbirds, and even a variety of, of, of insects and other critters we don't think about too awful much. Obviously it's taken a very contentious Endangered Species Act listing proposal to sort of make everyone come together um, and often that's you know that's the way it works when you're facing a um, kind of a challenge or a controversial sort of issue. The sage grouse is a landscape species so it has to be addressed on private land and public land. Uh, these states made a commitment up front to uh, using the best science available, understanding that no knowledge is perfect and that some things may change, so they also look at a, an adaptive management approach to, to dealing with sage-grouse and sage-grouse habitats. But it's this collaborative nature, I think, that has uh, produced what many of us view as a very successful effort on the part of especially Oregon and Idaho. I think it's pretty obvious um, you know why we're seeing that decline across many of the states and that's because of habitat condition. I mean it, it's really a habitat story. The major threats include wildfire and the accompanying uh, invasive species, invasive plant species that uh, go along with these large wildfires. Wildfires totally wipe out sage grouse habitat. Habitat condition continues to decline because of invasive species like annual grass that aren't native to this range and then the, the fires that follow those invasions and those big fire cycles, those big years where we see huge fires across the landscape. Right, so cheatgrass is an annual grass from another continent that's really pervasive in the sagebrush ecosystem and uh, it loves fire and so the more you burn it the more prolific it gets so each year that it burns you know it, it grows over winter uh, dries out early and then uh, accelerates that fire cycle. Sagebrush is, most sagebrush species are fire intolerant. So once you burn them, they die. And you have to reseed areas uh, via um, really small seed dispersal that happens by wind actually for sagebrush. So it takes a long time for sagebrush to recover in most places after fire. Uh, we lost some private ground. I, I can't tell you, about a thousand acres, I guess. But the BLM allotment, it toasted it, toasted it, totally. And we lost 39 head of livestock that, that, that we found, uh, either badly wounded and we had to euthanize them or they were already dead. And we still have walking wounded at the ranch that have been burned and burned feet and um, upper respiratory issues that most likely are from smoke inhalation. So to try to break up these areas into um, chunks, 50,000 acres to 100,000 acres, and provide a fuel break for the firefighters uh, to get out here and have some defensible space. Conditions are extreme, at least they can compartment that fire to 50 to 100,000 acres rather than you know, some of these fires are 400,000 acres plus, which that's a huge detriment to sage grouse. I mean, it's, it's a landscape scale disturbance rather than a, a patch. With uh, some of the changes that have occurred in the last 150 years since humans have been here, at least these uh, European settlers have been here, um, juniper has started to 
invade the shrub step um, landscape um, and if allowed to invade unchecked will lose that sagebrush which is so important to to wildlife to utilize Hart Mountain. So we are in the process and have been for, for a few years now of, of basically taking that juniper that's coming down to the sagebrush and, and removing it back to where it might exist naturally. But the juniper has taken over and encroached upon tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of acres and but it's a, but it is a treatment that we can do we can see the impacts immediately and birds really are responsive to that they start moving in and using those areas that they historically used but have been unavailable to them in a lot of these sites such as this one uh, we get juniper encroaching out into sagebrush step and that's a negative for sage grouse um, for one it allows perch sites for raptors that like to target sage grouse if you're near nesting or, or lecking sites. And so our efforts in Oregon through SGI have really focused on helping ranchers in, in and around these core habitats remove those encroaching trees so that we have large intact uh, sagebrush shrublands really and not woodlands. From the standpoint of juniper the thing everybody says well how much water does juniper use and and the research tells us that a, a 12 inch diameter tree like one of those big trees over there that are still standing in the springtime when soil moisture is available those trees have the capability of using somewhere between 30 to 40 gallons of water a day. What that means is that 9 to 35 trees per acre can use all the water potentially that's delivered in that 13 inch precip zone. The tree density over there probably is about 60 to 70 trees per acre. So the, you start running the numbers through your head, we've already on site potentially used all the water just for tree growth nothing for shrubs, for grasses, for grouse, for irrigation, for fish, for recreation. The pieces of the puzzle are, we're starting to figure it out. We now know where some of the most important places are for grouse, they call those core habitats, um, and those concentrations that host the largest number of birds, the, the densest breeding uh, density of birds, they know where that stuff is and we know what challenges birds face whether it's like the juniper trees behind me right now, that, that's a big challenge. Well, we can now map those junipers so we know where the most important uh, places are. We know where some of the threats are like juniper. Here in Oregon, uh, we've basically uh, solved about 68% of this juniper problem on our priority private lands. And so we can start to measure this and, and show that we're making demonstrable progress. So yeah, I'm optimistic about the trajectory. It takes as much work to cut a juniper down, put it in a, in a pile, opposed to cutting a juniper down, limbing it, putting it into a mini log deck, and salvaging it at, at a later date. So it's a total win-win. Those are all encompassed in my mind. Sage grouse, watershed, rangeland restoration, hazardous fuel. The consumer of today is so green orientated. He, if he can just put in two raised garden beds, he feels he's helping sage grouse, rangeland restoration, and employment in eastern Oregon, which obviously is really bad. Uh, uh, every time you turn around in the sagebrush, uh, you see a new road. It, it's it, extraordinarily easy to make a road through sagebrush. You just drive across a piece of sagebrush a couple of times and there you have it and uh, road development has not been very well regulated on our, on our BLM public lands. And it's very difficult to do uh, because of, of the easy access of the terrain to a variety of vehicles. And yet, if you look at some of the work that, that we've done, that the scientists have done uh, even 10 and 12 years ago, we showed a clear relationship between uh, roads and fire. The more roads we had, the more fire we tended to have, which if you think about it makes a little bit of sense. One of the most important things for, for the sagebrush and for the landscape that sage grouse and other species rely on is just keeping it intact. We don't really have to be doing that much stuff and that's where we're at in a juncture uh, in our history I would say that you know a lot of the places 
are do, still intact and we just have to recognize them and make sure that those places still stay intact but where opportunities exist like take a ton of uh in areas where it's been chewed up by a lot of user created roads and you have a whole bunch of duplicate roads yeah identifying the roads that aren't necessary and doing some restoration for those that's a great project it's too many it's too much uh because when the roads are there people are going to use them uh without some direction to tell them not to and you just can't keep fragmenting this property uh and yeah you can drive almost anywhere out here that you want to uh with a four-wheel drive and the brush or what have you uh and the more roads you put then people are cut between roads and now you got another road but oregon is is a state um with one of the highest road densities um, across our vast landscape. And it's it's a concern not only in sagebrush, but also in forested habitats as well. The proliferation of energy development and energy related infrastructure, that includes roads and it includes power lines and so forth. We're talking about a wildland species. They do not do very well uh, close to habitats that have been impacted by development. Development is is certainly a concern and it's one of the threats that we can really um, have a hands-on approach and address as thoroughly as possible. It's, it's not mother nature at play with that particular threat. So uh, I know people have said, you know, it's uh, what's good for the sage grass is good for the economy, what's good for the bird is good for the herd. That's really true in this case. If the bird's listed and you're restricted from using the public lands, which most people depend on for four or five months of forage each year, uh, we're in big trouble, big trouble. But unless we've got Herefords running around playing with matches, uh, uh, ranching and, and livestock grazing pose nowhere near the threat to sage grouse that say wildfire and invasive species do. Uh, most of our bunch grasses in this ecosystem are growing during the spring months and are basically done by midsummer. They're most sensitive to grazing during that period and so um, we don't want to repeatedly hit them with grazing every single growing season and so a lot of the work we do with producers is talking about how can we rotate livestock around so that uh, we have patchiness and that these plants have the ability to rest and recover. Um, and you know our, our ranchers understand that they want to pass this land on down to the next generation and they're willing to implement those things. So I don't know that I'm optimistic but I'm optimistic that we can take steps to get us moving in the right direction and to move at a faster pace than we have been. So I'm very optimistic and one of the reasons why is that collaboration is really breaking down old barriers. Agencies are working together stakeholders are at the table that you know whether it's ranchers and environmentalists we're all you know pulling towards that common objective of trying to keep the sage grouse you know on the landscape and healthy populations i'm highly encouraged uh you know we started out in this effort now it seems over two years ago and in fact i was part of the team in 2005 that made the uh, not warranted finding for Fish and Wildlife Service, and then again part of the team in 2010 that made the warranted but precluded finding and now here we are uh, again, five years later, so it's been a total of 10 years that we've been working on this. And when we have the full picture, then I'll know whether I'm optimistic or pessimistic about the outcome for sage grouse in the future. My gut tells me at this point that uh, uh, given the efforts by the states and the various federal agencies, the Fish and Wildlife Service will probably decide on a not warranted uh, decision. My gut also tells me that decision will immediately be litigated and we will have conservation by the courts somewhere down the road. I just want to encourage you to stay the course, to show how Oregon can be a leader and a model for other states where we have more tension and politically more tension between the politicians and the people on the ground, the landowners that are making it work.